Welcome to the Government Finance Officers Association's training school district roundtable on COVID-19 financial and related impacts. This webinar is approximately one hour in length and worth one continuing professional education credit based on a 50 minute hour. All participants connections have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. If you have questions throughout the presentation, you can submit them using the Q&A feature in the panel on the right hand side of your screen. GFOA staff is standing by to reply. At the conclusion of the event, you'll be redirected to a short survey to evaluate the content of today's presentation. CPE certificates will be emailed to all registered participants within approximately two weeks. With that, all yours, Matt. All right, thank you very much. Uh, morning or uh, uh, early afternoon to everyone on the line. Uh, my name is Matt Bubnis. I'm with the Government Finance Officers Association. I work in our research and consulting center. Um, uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we, we know um, how busy all of you are in terms of all the activities uh, uh, related to figuring out uh, either how to open school or in the midst of opening school uh, in, in regards to the pandemic and the related pressures. And uh, we hope we can provide you with some uh, useful insights or, or hopefully some takeaways in, in terms of, of being able to better um, uh, serve your community, better serve your students. So. Um, Really, with today, really just want to give a chance for the, uh, the the five other folks I have on the line with me today uh, to share some more of their experiences, uh, and then also at the end too, uh, if you look through the presentation a little bit, we have some polls uh, that are done through Poll Everywhere um, that allow you to kind of share some of your thoughts on these four questions, uh, and then kind of the, the the fun feature about it, if you can call it fun, uh, is actually a chance to vote or like other people's comments as well. So as those get more likes. Uh, it's called an upvote feature. Those will kind of rise to the, the top of the screen and then the panelists um, can respond a little bit more to what they've seen on that um, and, and comment a little bit further on that as well. So, and we're gonna be using that as the way to uh, uh, earn your CPEs as well. So I'll share the link here in a second uh, for that poll everywhere. So you can type your name in there and get set up on that. Uh, so when we get to the polls uh, after the first 15, 20, minutes or so of the presentation, uh, you'll be ready to go in terms of uh, sharing some of your experiences or questions or comments uh, and the like. So um, uh, with that, I uh, just want to kind of flip to the next screen here, if my computer lets me do that. There we go. Um, so I guess I just talked about the agenda there without flipping in the slide. Sorry about that. Um, but here's the important thing is the Poll Everywhere uh, URL. Uh, so it's www.gfoa.org slash school dash CFO. Uh, so if you go to that URL, it'll redirect you right into uh, the Poll Everywhere screen and you can enter your name. And then once we hit those slides in terms of those questions, uh, you can um, uh, type in your comments. So again, uh, this is how we're going to use uh, to record attendance in the CPE portion of it. So um, uh, please do that. And when we get to that portion of the screen, if you don't catch the URL on the screen, uh, Kate will uh, uh, pop that over into the comment bar. So you'll be able to click back on that URL, URL as well. And I'll make sure I say it a couple of times as well to uh, make sure everyone gets a chance to, uh, to get in there. So. Um, so the first thing we have here, just want to let everyone know, if you didn't catch our webinar last week, uh, release the fiscal first aid for school districts. It's a part of our fiscal first aid series, which offers near and, and longer term recommendations on how to deal with uh, financial impacts related to the pandemic. Um, this is kind of the school's addendum, uh, specifically uh, kind of centered around uh, some of the key concerns that you all are facing and are in the midst of. Uh, so a guidance on a number of different areas, shorter term opportunities, longer term opportunities, the URL is there, free to download, free to access, member, non-member, doesn't matter. Uh, you can pull that down and take a look at that. So uh, so with that, you might've heard us kind of talking back and forth um, uh, to, to get everyone up and going and on the line. Uh, but the folks we have uh, on the line with us today include Lisa Bracken, she's the CFO of Atlanta Public Schools. In Georgia, we have Matt Lentz. He's the CFO of Upper Moreland School District in Pennsylvania. It's a suburban district of Philadelphia. We have Judith Marte. She's the CFO of Broward County Public Schools in Florida. Then we have Bill Sutter, the CFO of Boulder Valley School District in Colorado. And last but not least, and mostly since she has the longest title of all of them, we had to put her on the last line there since it didn't fit. Uh, it's Michelle Trongard, the Associate Superintendent for Business and Finance in Mansfield Independent School District in Texas. So all the speakers on the line, they've been uh, involved uh, uh, heavily in our uh, school budgeting best practices work, if you've seen that, and are members of our Alliance for Excellence in School Budgeting, which I'll put a URL up on the last slide uh, when we're kind of closing things out, if you're interested in hearing more about the work with that. 
um, and uh, and the like. So, so with that, I uh, want to turn it over to Lisa to give some kind of introductory comments about what's been going on in Atlanta. Uh, we'll hit a couple of minutes on on each one of the districts and, and hear more from the CFO from each before we go into the polls. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Matt. This is Lisa Bracken. I've been the Chief Financial Officer at Atlanta Public Schools for three years now. Uh, we are a medium-sized urban district, around 52,000 kids. Uh, I know for some folks that's a large district, but we also uh, have some districts on this call that are much larger, I am sure. Um, for COVID-19, we are planning on reopening August 24th with all students virtual. Uh, we will be looking every nine weeks at our um, reopening strategies. We've developed a strategy for a hybrid model for when spread here in Georgia and in the Atlanta area is considered more moderate. Uh, we are currently in a high spread state, which is why we're opening virtual. Um, we also have a model that uh, contemplates returning back full time to brick and mortar if and when we return to a low to no spread state. So we have a red, green, and yellow operating model. Uh, we're opening in red in virtual. Uh, every nine weeks, we will reassess that. We did go ahead and bring our staff back on August 3rd. That was the first day of their contract. And what we've been doing with our staff um, since August 3rd and what we will continue to do up until August 24th is just uh, continuing to do some professional learning, preparing our teachers for what virtual learning um, looks like, some best practices in virtual learning, so lots and lots of PD. We're also using this time to supply for students. Um, that might be art supply kits, that might be devices, that might be hot spots, that might be a jump rope and a uh, kickball. So we're looking at um, getting everything through our warehouse and delivered out to schools and then schools are coordinating pickups at their individual locations so that uh, kiddos have everything that they need, parents feel ready to support virtual learning when we start up on August 24th. Our food distribution did start back um, on the third as well. Right now we are still doing uh, the summer feeding, which allows us to do community feeding. On August 24th, we will be going back to just our students. Um, and we are looking to see if that's something that can be changed, but uh, we will be doing food distribution on Mondays and that will be supported by our transportation and our bus drivers. Um, I think I've already mentioned the, the reassess every nine weeks. Um, and I think that's enough kind of background for APS, happen to take any questions that you may have later on in the presentation. Thanks, Lisa. And, uh... I will advance the slide here. Sorry, there we go. Um, oh, good, I didn't skip over. Uh, with that, I'll turn over to Bill for a little bit. Uh, good morning or afternoon, everybody. Uh, so I'm Bill Sutter, I'm the CFO for the Boulder Valley School District. Uh, I've been the CFO for, um, I don't know, four or five years, but I've been with Boulder Valley for uh, something like 23. Uh, so I've been here for quite some time. Uh, we're a, a large by some standards district, uh, medium sized by other standards, uh, suburban. Um, we're about uh, 30 minutes uh, outside of Denver. Um, we work 500 square miles, so we do go from the Continental Divide uh, to um, uh, Broomfield, Colorado. So we, we have a pretty large area that we cover. Uh, so, as everybody knows, transportation is a, a big. Uh, concern and issue uh, as we move through these different um, phases and in person versus not in person, small group, whatever. Uh, and so, um, uh, for us, that's a that's a big challenge because we're we're a fairly uh, large, spread out district. Um, we uh, originally had the start of school, uh, I believe it was the nineteenth, uh, and we pushed that back for a, a week. Uh, to August 26th uh, to give teachers a little more time to plan and prepare uh, for the phase of opening that was happening at that point in time. Uh, like others, we have changed our opening plans probably four times over the last month. Uh, as new information comes along or 
uh, staffing issues crop up or uh, infection rates change, you know, all those things are, are feeding into this uh, right now. So uh, we'll be opening uh, fully virtual uh, home learning, uh, as we're calling it, uh, on August 26th. Um, it is a, uh, at the, the reason for uh, going with that uh, home learning or virtual learning uh, is really a staffing issue more than it is uh, an infection rate issue. We're seeing uh, some uh, climbing of the, the infection rates, but not a, a significant amount. So it really wasn't a, a health department call or issue with, um, uh, to push us into that home learning, but really a staffing issue um, uh, with the number of um, employees that we had, teachers in particular, that um, submitted the, the waivers for um, not being able to, to be in front of a class full of kids. Um, so that's that was really a big concern for us. Uh, you know, the I have a number of things here listed on the on the uh, slide about short term, long term concerns, uh, you know, funding issues. That's top of mind for everybody. Um, the, both in the current year, as well as uh, the out years, the recovery is going to be likely very slow. Um, the challenges with uh, any sort of federal intervention or federal rescue uh, and the stalemate that's going to exist uh, for at least several more months likely uh, is going to pose some challenges. Um, the One of the things that we're struggling with right now is this idea of uh, folks um, you know, where there isn't work to do, uh, particularly bus drivers, uh, if we're in a virtual environment. Uh, and what we do to uh, to provide work for those folks or give them options around furlough or taking other roles within the district, uh, something to maintain their health insurance so that we're not uh, too callous of uh, just letting people go. Uh, and also, I know um, districts all across the country uh, struggle with finding bus drivers uh, and getting them trained and having qualified people to, to do that. So uh, it will pose some significant challenges if uh, a couple of months from now, we're trying to return to in-person learning uh, and we uh, don't have bus drivers because they couldn't afford to not work or unemployment benefits weren't enough to sustain them. Uh, and we lose all those folks to Amazon drivers or UPS or FedEx uh, when it comes to um, uh, getting into the winter holiday season where uh, there's a lot more hiring going on there. Um, I've got a link to our reintroduction plan. Uh, we've had folks working uh, you know, last three months uh, coming up with this reintroduction plan. It's a five phase plan that kind of allows us to shift uh, between them. Uh, the interesting thing uh, about this is we got to uh, this home learning is kind of phase one, but we're calling it phase one plus. So we're now even modifying this five uh, stage plan uh, because of the, the changing environment that we're working in. I'd have a link to our child care handbook because uh, we're uh, really working to provide child care for folks uh, in a, a licensed child care um, structure. Uh, that is uh, affordable, um, follows all the health guidelines, uh, and um, uh, provides some level of comfort that uh, to parents that their their kids will be taken care of uh, in a safe environment uh, if they have to go back to work. Uh, I think that's probably about it. We're you know doing like other folks are food distribution, uh, community feeding uh, has gone on all summer. Uh, we're trying to maintain that, hoping that there's some flexibility within rules uh, to, to keep doing that into the fall. Um, you know, we, we're not a high poverty area by any stretch of the imagination, uh, but we do have some pockets of poverty. Uh, and certainly as uh, job losses have mounted, um, additional folks uh, uh, needing that uh, assistance that uh, schools provide with food. So. Um, really looking to to maintain that going forward. 
So I think I'll leave it with that and move on to the next presenter. Thanks, Bill. Um, Judy, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, um, Matt. My name is Judy Marte. I am the Chief Financial Officer for the Broward County Public Schools, uh, located in South Florida. We are the, I think I've forgotten, uh, sixth largest district in the nation. Um, I have had the honor and privilege to serve as their CFO for the last three years under the leadership of Robert Runcie, who is an amazing superintendent. Um, we actually, um, our teachers reported today. So today was the first day of teachers reporting back to school. Um, we will be opening school a week from today, 100% virtual online learning. We um, are one of the hardest hit areas in the nation as far as current COVID cases. Um, significant pediatric numbers testing positive, which is of grave concern to the school district. Uh, we have been working remotely most of the summer. Our principals reported back about a month ago on a, on a staggered schedule. So the principals and the leadership team at the schools, along with the custodial staff at the schools reported back uh, but not all on the same day. So if the principal's in on Monday and Wednesday, the AP's in on Tuesday and Thursday to make sure that we're um, honoring social distancing and trying to make sure we keep our staff safe. In spite of that, we have reported since the onset of the pandemic, over 500 staff members in the district testing positive. We obviously believe most of those cases happened outside of our buildings. Um, but in one instance, there was a significant spread. It actually hit my department. My accounting department was shut down completely about a month ago when we had um, seven staff members on, on that floor test positive um, for COVID. So it, it has hit this area of the country extraordinarily hard. Um, I won't get into my um, opinion about the, the politics of not making statewide masks mandatory, they are mandatory in Broward County. Um, as I said, we intend to start school virtually for all students on August 19th. We have done um, what I believe is a tremendous job communicating out our plan. On the, you'll see the link to the plan on the slide in front of you. It is very detailed. I will tell you it has been shared with Aspen Institute, with uh, the Council of Great City Schools. Um, it, it is a very, very well thought out document. We have a strategic leadership team who actually partners with me um, in the work around GFOA's smart school spending um, um, and the alliance work. Um, and by the name of Dr. Posner, who I wanna give a shout out, she's done tremendous work with her very small but mighty team making sure that we have communicated with all our stakeholders as to how we intend to open schools. Uh, the teachers are back today. They're back virtually. They're doing online training on how to work with our students virtually, which most of them have been doing all summer. We've spent significant millions of dollars um, in making sure our teachers are prepared to give meaningful online lessons all of our lessons will be live. Teachers will be required to be on camera. This week, we also have our third week of parent training on how to support their children in learning in a virtual world. Our first time that we will review and reassess where we go into the next phase of bringing children back, which will likely be our ESE self-contained classrooms, is expected at this time to be early October. Uh, that's what we declared to our school board yesterday. The plan we developed was worked through 16 work streams where all stakeholders, including our unions, were appropriately involved in those work streams. And you'll see that if you uh, decide to look at the document that uh, um, we've shared with you. Um, the biggest issue for us now, we've closed out last year, uh, and because we went virtual in March, 
we do have a significant increase to our fund balance because we stopped paying all extra duty overtime, part-time staff that worked less than 20 hours. Um, our buses didn't run, so there were millions of dollars of fuel savings. Our utility costs went down significantly in South Florida. Air conditioning is a big issue at a huge expense, but when there's no bodies in the building, air conditioners don't run as hard. So our um, utility costs were down millions of dollars. So I was able to put aside some money, although my year-end revenue losses exceeded 15 million because of shortfalls in tax collections, as well as Medicaid reimbursement because our students weren't in school and our daycare revenue was down significantly because we didn't offer daycare the last quarter of our year. Our after aftercare daycare program is one of the largest in the nation, generates nearly $70 million in revenue. That's, the, that's generated to support the program because we have that many families who avail themselves of those programs that are run at every one of our um, elementary and K through eight schools. As far as budgeting for this year, the state held us harmless as far as our FTE and we were, um, our projected FTE is the budget we received. They generally true up that budget to actual FTE in October and December, I'm sorry, October and February. This year, they've agreed to forego the true up of October, meaning if we have a lot of kids not show up initially, um, we won't be penalized up front. But Florida has the habit of doing a mid-year holdback. So during the recession, um, Broward County Public Schools mid-year holdback was nearly $60 million. And we're all school folks, so we know all our money is in um, positions. And if you get that kind of holdback in the middle of the year, it's going to mean layoffs. So I've taken um, the favorable year-end close and the money from the CARES Act and set aside most of those dollars in anticipation of what I expect to be a mid-year holdback in excess of $100 million. Um, again, I, I do want to say I'm proud of the work that Broward's done around communication. We're happy to share all of our detailed documents. We actually have a 200-page handbook on reopening. Um, our board has been very involved with weekly meetings, as has been all of our parent support groups. And no matter what I think we all do, I think the biggest takeaway from this is there's no playbook for this. Um, we can, I've been a CFO in a school district now 30 years, three years in Broward, 15 years in Miami, and 13 years in a little school district up in Massachusetts. And there's no playbook for this. I think the most important thing we can do as finance officers is plan for the worst, hope for the best, um, and make sure we're communicating um, not only to our peers and our boards, but to our communities. So with that, Matt, I'll, I'll turn it over to the next speaker, and I want to thank you all. Well, thank, well, thanks for that. And um, I, I think uh, I'd love to see that link of how to uh, uh, better educate your child at home if, if Broward ever shares that as a, a parent of an incoming second grader. So, so we will get that out to, to you later today. I know there's a handbook for it, Matt, and, and Broward is, Mr. Runcie is very transparent. And if we've done the work and it will help another school district and help another family, we're more than happy to share that. No, I was I was uh, somewhat joking, but I I am I'm very appreciative. So, and uh, yes, I I, I remember uh, Bob well from from my years at Chicago Public Schools too. So, well, and your and your loss was our gain. Yes, it was. <laughs> uh, with that, I'm uh, going to turn it over to the next presenter here. Uh, if the slide cooperates with me and forwards. There we go. Uh, so we have Michelle Trongard from from Mansfield Independent School District. And uh, if you see what their opening day is, uh, extra special thanks to Michelle uh, for for joining us and and taking some of her time out on the uh, the the opening day of a virtual school for for Mansfield. So <laughs> you hit it. Today is the day. So actually, we started with uh, staff in person, just like um, Lisa did on August the third. Uh, but uh, just a quick intro about me as I am Michelle Trungard and I just started this district on January 21st. Um, and so it's been a pretty much a whirlwind since I got here <laughs> and uh, trying to get to know the staff and, and learning how to communicate in a different virtual world has been extremely important. 
and uh, that is, is, has taught our district to um, have a better communication skills along the way. Uh, so we started today, uh, so far so good. However, if you do Google Mansfield ISD, you will see that um, our technology rollout was terrible and parents waited in line about 10 hours, some 12 hours, some running out of gas. It made the news almost every day for the past two days. Uh, it got better and now we're gonna deliver them to the devices to the students in transportation. So if I can give advice, since we're a little bit on the forefront um, than most of your start dates, the rest of the group here and those that might be listening is just to ensure your technology is everything is ready to roll and they have it all inventoried, identified to a student, everything's ready. Um, we, we, we learned a lot through that process, but we'll get there. Uh, so what we have is we have a virtual, um, virtual learning process along with a remote option for those that will come back to school in person September the 8th. Those that took the virtual academy can continue to do so throughout the year, but they can switch to remote learning after nine weeks. So, but they can't do it in the middle. They have to go, or they can go vice versa. Remote can go back to virtual academy. So this is a little bit of a hybrid model um, and we're gonna, hopefully it's gonna pan out and work well for the students. Some of the key points I wanna point out is that, uh, I don't know, Bill pretty much hit it too. It, it has changed daily. We had so much numerous guidance from the state level, national level, state level to local health authorities and someone's trumping somebody. And so we finally had to go from a September 28th start date to a September 8th start, you know, as far as getting the in-person so that was a big adjustment. And um, uh, then how, do, how are you gonna have it? The teachers, we have our teachers coming in the classroom to do virtual or remote, with either way. So there was big concerns about employees that have children and what do you do with the daycare? We have a, a, a daycare for some of the employees, but we also have an after school care we don't get a lot of funds for that and people, you know, as far as those that uh, typically use the daycare for after school, um, that's not happening since most everybody's at home during this time. So we've lost a lot of funding there, a lot of funding in facility rentals, but the employees, children, so we've teamed up with um, churches in the area. They wanted to help out. This community is a very tight community and they do a lot of uh, back to school bash and handing out um, free backpacks and supplies and things like that. So it's a really close knit, but churches did step up and they offered to help out. They do charge um, for their students, for the kids to stay there, but we did have an option if they needed it. Another thing that Bill mentioned is the bus drivers, crossing guards, student nutrition employees. We passed what's called, we call the pay resolution uh, last night at our board meeting, and that's to say uh, to the benefit of the um, morale of the employees and the best of the district. It's it's like if we have snow days or ice days and they can't come in, we don't harm them for not being able to come in. So for those that are not driving buses, we do want this pay resolution to pass. However, they're still going to be busy. Our bus drivers have been helping technology out. They're teaming up and helping the cleaning and, and getting things ready for school. Uh, so, but we don't want is directors, coordinators to have to monitor every minute that they're working. So they clock in and out and only get those hours. Uh, so we have a gap hole. That's the pay resolution to fill the gap. So it's not a gift of public funds. Um, keeping track of funding and eligible expenditures. You know, we have the coronavirus relief fund, the CARES Act funds that's part of the, or the CARES Act, uh, the coronavirus relief fund is part of the CARES Act fund. We passed what uh, was recent um, under the coronavirus relief fund. Uh, the state held back 200 million um, for school districts. And what they came out with was a collaborative effort between our state agency our um, Dallas Independent School District superintendent and his team 
along with the governor's office, came up with what's called Operation Connectivity. And on that uh, Operation Connectivity, we it was to provide in-person or distance learning for students that needed it so that we could get technology in the hands of those that couldn't get it. So we applied for it. You had four days, you got Chromebooks, hotspots, and then you they matched half of your submission. And then you could team up with cities and counties and we asked for their funding and we got a uh, city of Mansfields on Monday night for a half a million. So it was a collaborative effort between all the uh, different sources and trying to do what's best to get technology in the hands of our students. So um, continuation of learning. Um, so really in the hold harmless funding, same thing with um, what Judy said is that uh, our first 12 weeks, they are not gonna hold harmless or they we're gonna be held harmless on average daily attendance so that we can get through this mess and try to figure out how to do all the attendance. But after that, it's probably gonna be very accountable and funding will take uh, back to the normality of what we are used to to get through the year. But our state budget, and just like everybody else's, is in, is in a pretty big, bad situation. So we have that coming up too. But okay, that's about all I have, Matt. Thanks so much, Michelle. I appreciate those thoughts. And with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, Matt Lentz. Um, uh, in addition to being the CFO of Upper Moreland School District, Matt also serves on GFOA's executive board as well. So with that, uh, Matt, if you want to share a little bit more uh, about what you've uh, been going through over the last uh, couple of months. Sure. Uh, so uh, Upper Moreland School District, as Matt referenced in the introduction, uh, we are uh, for Pennsylvania, a medium-sized school district. Uh, Pennsylvania has almost 500 school districts. Uh, with 3,200 students, we're a suburb of Center City, Philadelphia. Uh, so in addition to all the points that the prior speakers identified, you know, we have really gone through a complete uh, overhaul of both our programming as well as our service models for our community. Uh, we have our students starting virtually on um, August 31st, um, and that's going until November. Uh, we, just like what many individuals have referenced on this call, continue to try to work through and plan based upon what is changing at both a state level with guidance as well as with county uh, guidance that we operate under and also the various uh, uh, organizations that have a uh, different say. So for example, we are um, starting virtual. Um, we've had to also plan to do a hybrid model because uh, the state came out with indicators that um, may necessitate that uh, transition sooner rather than later. Also, we are still, even though we're hybrid, operating with sports and facilities use in our buildings. Uh, that's based upon what the sports have not yet. Uh, the organization has continued to support sports taking place. So what does that mean other than that? Um, similar to the other panelists, we're working through a lot of changes and challenges. Uh, I've really had to really focus you know, myself and my staff. Uh, also, I have a, a new superintendent who's seven days on the job at this point, uh, really working through what our budget looks like and what our staffing under these various models looks like. Uh, for a school district of our size, we've continued to work through with our labor groups. Uh, we actually have a total of six labor contracts um, for our district that we are trying to navigate. And as other um, individuals have said, um, utilize workers to their best capacity and also make adjustments with regards to right sizing our staffing. Uh, we also, as a state, uh, are anticipating changes to our state funding. Uh, one um, particular piece is that our homeowners get what is called a property tax rebate if they live in a home that they, the primary residence, but that's funded off of gambling funds, which is essentially casino revenue. And our casinos were closed for a period of three to four months. The state actually did a stopgap on that this year with CARES Act funds. But for next year, even if we were to not increase our taxes in Pennsylvania is uh, predominantly funded in my area, school district with 80% uh, local tax money, we'll have to uh, explain and communicate to residents and our community that uh, the tax bills will go up because of the loss of any dollars on that rebate. So really the big thing that I think, you know, we're um, working on in addition to 
our planning, our budgeting models, our scenario analysis is really communications because even though we were closed since March 12th of last year, uh, we did not have some of the savings that other speakers um, have, uh, have mentioned um, because we were mandated by our state legislature to still pay all employees what they would have gotten paid through the end of the year. Um, but that message was not communicated well to our taxpayers who anticipated that the closing of schools would yield savings. So we're constantly communicating not only the um, burdens that we are under in the state, how we're working with our budget, but also undergoing what I've termed a right sizing plan, which essentially involves local decisions in our schools, in our departments as to what is the best use of our resources, as well as based upon our goals and objectives as an organization. Um, but recognizing that our schools are not operating the way that they had previously and are going to begin a new operation period um, as we uh, begin virtual uh, instruction. At the same point in time, I'm also viewing this class half full with uh, really using this as an opportunity to redesign some systems and processes that are duplicative or uh, are still paper intensive uh, to gain not only efficiency, but also to, to streamline and um, you know, reduce not only work burden, uh, but also um, different staff time on um, normal functions. And I guess I'll turn it back over to Matt. Great, thanks Matt for, for sharing those points and, and also mentioning communications. That's a nice segue for our first poll uh, that I'll share here in a second. And the one thing I just wanted to note really quick, um, as we were kind of organizing this webinar and getting folks together, uh, we, we didn't intend to have uh, five districts all who are opening virtually in the next couple of weeks here on the line. I don't think anyone had decided definitively at the point when we were putting this on the calendar and, and getting people to um, speak for this definitively knew what their opening plans were going to look like. So, um, you know, I'm hoping we can do a webinar like this in the future too, and, and we'll make sure we have um, or, or try our best depending upon where we are in, in a couple of months and, and who knows what that really looks like at this point, um, but to have uh, folks on the line too who are also uh, you know, either doing in person or going full speed ahead in terms of, of going back to in person instruction too. So, um, but with that, um, want to put up the first poll here, and it looks like we have a, a lot of folks who already responded to this one here. So, I um, want to hear a little bit more in terms of what communication strategies, tools, and the like have been most effective during the pandemic, whether that's with parents, students, staff, uh, senior leadership. Uh, as we can see here, there's a lot of mention of, of, of Zoom further down the line here. Uh, also, special board meetings as well. Um, uh, you know, really how information is shared, I think it's really crucial, you know, not in terms of only just the tools and devices, uh, but how it's done, you know, and, and also making sure that kind of keep a pulse on how effective it is as well. And I, I don't know, I, I know Judy, when we were going through some of the planning for this, she had been mentioning more about communications. I don't know if you have any more comments about that or, or Matt, if you, if you have kind of some responses to that as well, or, or you know, Lisa, Bill or Michelle for, for that matter as well, in terms of things that have worked well, um, things that you've reassessed as you've, you've communicated with the community and the like. Hey, Matt, this is Lisa. I can jump in. Um, one of the things that we've been doing that's been very successful is um, these fireside chats that are specific to a, uh, a concern or an issue, right? So our superintendent will host about an hour long um, Facebook live evening fireside chat around six o'clock each evening. And we will have a topic, so we'll have a pre-K night. And if you're very interested in learning about how we might do pre-K in a virtual setting and how to register and how to get in all of your documents and everything, then you might tune in to the pre-K one. We have a high school one coming up tonight. Um, we've done certain ones around just, uh, you know, so it's topic specific. If you're, uh, if you have a, a special ed student, you might tune into that one. And so your fireside chats are very, uh, we started out with just big town halls and they were very broad and um, you know those were very important at the beginning but then we were seeing so many questions were very specific concerns 
So we started breaking out those big town halls into these fireside chats, and that's been very successful. For our staff, we've been doing a similar thing. We have um, something called Workplace that's through Facebook, but it's kind of the internal platform, and we use that to communicate with staff and to get staff feedback um, and their questions and concerns kind of real time. So that's how we've been communicating with our public, and it's been very effective so far. Right, no, an appropriate name for these times too, since we're facing the worst economic crisis since the uh, the Great Depression. So, other uh, thoughts from other folks on the line? Matt, this is Michelle. So, I um, I will say I have been completely impressed with our communications department because I know that they have actually gone above and beyond like every other school district. And municipality and everybody, because they have to do, they've done an excellent job at social media. And we do a video kind of the superintendent speaking on social on Facebook or, or Twitter or whatever. They do a, a video on that, but they are constantly communicating either through Facebook, interacting with everybody and lots of emails to our staff, um, lots of uh, meetings. With your, with the principals and the, their staff and us as as well with principals, but I really think that it's just a very user friendly website on our website for our staff and our community and parents, and I think that's what's made a big difference in them being on board. Um, so I think we might have you can over communicate, but I think that's where we're at. We're, we're at a point, it's changing. We've got to communicate a lot. Great. I'm just curious out of, of, out of uh, the, the, the folks on the line, um, is there messaging that you're doing now in terms of kind of the financial ramifications for the future to, to get out in front of some of that in terms of, of sensitizing the community and making them aware of, of what some of those shortfalls are? And sorry if I interrupted somebody right as they were ready to talk to you. Well, this, so, this is Bill, so I'll jump in. <laughs> um, uh, on the communication side, just a piece that's a challenge is, uh, I think that our communities aren't used to us changing our path and direction on such a frequent basis. So it's really hard for people to understand, well, you said last week that it was X and now it's something different. So that's just one of the, the huge communication challenges we're dealing with. Um, so set that aside from a financial piece. Uh, we haven't started that yet, but that is coming uh, probably in the next couple of board meetings uh, as we start to give budget updates. Um, we need to get some more information out of a, out of the state. They do quarterly revenue forecasts. Uh, so uh, rather than just pure speculation, uh, I kind of want to have something that's um, a little more uh, based on something out of the state. Um, and, but that is definitely coming uh, within the next, uh, I'd say, month or so, uh, setting people up to uh, start to understand those ramifications, uh, short term and long term, uh, of uh, the finances. Sure, and that that balance between the speculation and, and getting information out there for folks is an important one too. So, so uh, Judy was going to chime in. Yeah, go yes. ahead, Judy. Sorry. Yes, thank you. So, I actually have taken a, a different approach. Um, uh, uh, completely acknowledging that I'm careful to not not get into too much um, speculation, but with my board and quite frankly, um, as I said, I've been at, at this a very long time. It, my strategy has always been communicate early and often, um, so they're not surprised. So. We've had four budget workshops where we've talked about the impact of COVID. Um, and in addition to the revenue losses, um, so far since March, we've actually spent $6.3 million on cleaning supplies and PPE. So we've, we've got um, significant costs. The other big cost has been additional software we use Canvas to educate our students. We were fortunate in that we had enough devices for any child who did not have one, because two years ago, the board approved capital expenditures um, that provide us a refresh of all of our devices. 
we buy 47,000 devices every year. Um, and with that, we had almost 90,000 new devices to give out to children who said they needed them. Um, so, out, you know, the big additional costs around um, COVID training of staff, the parent training, uh, software to go to a learning environment that is much more digital than it had been. Um, the same thing some of my colleagues have talked about distribution of um, uh, supplies, materials, and all that. But um, I've done a lot of communication to let people know that if history repeats itself in Florida, we're going to have a massive media holdback. And quite frankly, it's worked out well because many of our union leaders have already contacted me and said, we understand, we know what happens. Um, tell us how we help save money. Tell us what we need to do. Um, we want to help you save our members' jobs. And to that end, one of our biggest unions um, has agreed to allow our bus drivers to help with cleaning. So they have something to do um, while we're virtual and we minimize overtime and the hiring of third party outside companies because they're going to fill in um, uh, overnight when we've got a school that's impacted by COVID um, or in other situations. The other thing that solves for us is in the state of Florida, there is a state statute that specifically prohibits governments from paying people, employees who are not rendering services or for paying them ahead of rendering services. So we've had to be very um, strategic in making sure we can justify keeping all our full-time staff. Um, but I've done a lot of communication already. Yeah, no, and it, as you talked about support staff too, Judy, that uh, was a nice segue into our next poll here that I just pulled up. Um, so how is your district support staff uh, going to be utilized? I um, mean, you know, reference to aides there in, in the question, but, you know, of course that can be um, um, talking more about uh, uh, bus drivers uh, and the like as well. So let things kind of filter through there with um, uh, some responses pulling in, but I, I don't know if there's kind of some um, initial thoughts from the panelists in terms of uh, uh, other thoughts related to support staff and what you've been doing. Um, you know, a, a couple of good examples, we talked about bus drivers already, uh, but I don't know if there's any thoughts on classroom aides um, from folks or, or special ed aides in terms of what you've been doing and you'd like to share a little bit. So, so, so Matt, oh, oh, go sorry. ahead, Matt. No, this can go. Sorry. Sorry, was that Lisa who talked before? I think Judy was jumping in too. I'll just very quickly say one of the things that we did um, with our some of our funds that we saved, much like Judy, we did a friending the spending freeze at the end of last year and we were able to um, build fund balance a bit. We used some of that fund balance at the beginning of this year to buy all of our Parapros um, devices as well. So they will be supporting uh, the, print, the, the teachers in each of their rooms to do breakouts and to support virtual learning this year. So that's the same answer for Broward. Our, our classroom aides and special need aides all have devices and will be supporting teachers in breakout sessions within their classrooms. Exact same thing Atlanta's doing. No, I'm just curious for the other three panelists too, um, in terms of, of, of uh, devices for your, your support staff, for the aides, like Judy just mentioned, I'm, I'm assuming Lisa, all of your aides have um, technology to connect. Is that the same for, for the other panelists as well? Because I know sometimes that can be a challenge in some districts. Matt, so for our district, yeah, we, we did a similar uh, movement. Uh, we also are providing all of our staff with um, real time training that we can do on demand uh, with regards to devices. Uh, we do have some staff that don't feel comfortable with utilizing technology and we're working on alternative arrangements uh, for them. We are, though, um, in my district, not um, doing anything other than for them for many. We have a lot of recess, lunch aids. Uh, those individuals are going to be furloughed. Yeah, and it, it looks like we don't have as much clear consensus on some of the uh, responses from from folks uh, on the line as well on this one. Although I do some see quite a few references to cleaning a little bit further down the line as well. 
Um, but it looks like uh, the, the unknown seems to be a, a little bit uh, um, more of a popular answer on this one or, or, or how to trying to figure out how to better utilize them. Michelle or Bill, did, do you have any uh, comments on this one or, or we can move on to the next one as well, either way? I was just going to say, I'm going to go ask them what they're doing today. So <laughs> I, I do think we're, giving, we're giving ideas for everyone on the line, Michelle, even the panelists. <laughs> I, I, do think, I do think it is about uh, just making sure that the teachers are supported. I, I walked through a building yesterday and checked on them and they seem to be pretty upbeat and ready to go, the teachers. So. I think it's just to make sure those teachers are, are well equipped and helping out with cleaning if they need to. Yeah, for us, um, I just messaged our uh, CIO because I'm I don't know about the uh, teacher aid support staff. Uh, I know certainly custodians and um, sort of the operational support staff generally don't have devices, um, but uh, the paraeducators. Um, uh, I don't know, so that's a that's a really good question. Um, I know we have a we're basically one to one uh, with Chromebooks for um, pre K twelve for all the staff. We kind of redistributed everything uh, for all the students rather, um, and same with staff. Uh, lots of uh, Chromebooks and uh, some laptops and whatnot. So um, we're we're pretty good on devices, but I don't know about the the teacher aides um, uh, generally. So. Yeah, I was, I, was, uh, I was a little curious uh, before I came to uh, GFOA, I worked for Chicago Public Schools as their special ed finance director, and we had uh, a real problem with getting devices to our special ed classroom aides. Um, you know, it's kind of twofold, uh, the cost, and then also they, they didn't really want them since it was hard to do redirections and support physical needs of students while having a device on them as well. So. Uh, anyways, with, with that, I'll move it over to the next poll here. So, uh, and we'll do our best to get all the polling responses out to everybody too after um, uh, the, the next day or two so you can kind of see what everybody else said. Uh, hopefully, I can be able to pull that down uh, without uh, sharing a whole lot of information or, or more personal information about folks too if you had to uh, provide that and pull everywhere. So, uh, so this question is what efforts are you currently implementing or considering to protect against revenue loss this fiscal year? Uh, and beyond, and I think all of our panelists hit on to that to, to, to some degree, uh, especially in terms of some of the savings you were to re able to realize um, from from effectively shutting down the building and, and shutting down in person instruction uh, in March. So, any any thoughts from from the folks in addition to some of the comments you had made earlier while we we watch some of the responses roll in here? I, I want to say this is where I think you do a spreadsheet and you line up all the different mechanisms of possible funding you can get and maximize where that pocket of money can go to, such as FEMA versus coronavirus relief funds that are now going through the T, well, through us, it's TDM um, state. That, but those are the things that I'm, I'm going to be grabbing at uh, that. Maybe it can be eligible through this type of uh, expenditure for that and versus another one and just maximize it out as best as we can. But as far as expenditures, shoot, <laughs> I, I don't know. We're going to have to do trade-offs in smarter school spending. Well, thanks for the plug on that tool, Michelle. Um, <laughs> And you can you can find that on the Smart School Spending website, and I'll I'll send that link out to folks as well when we try to send out the results from the poll. So, yeah. other thoughts from folks, or or maybe this even talking about this might be a a moment to talk about CARES money a little bit more, since I know Judy referenced that and Michelle just referenced that as well. But uh, sorry if it was if it was Bill who was was going to talk, or I don't know if it was Matt. Yeah, uh, so a couple things. Um, uh, there's just spending that isn't happening, right? So. I'm, mileage and travel and conferences and um, kind of uh, activities that won't be happening that uh, in the past our um, fund managers, uh, directors, whatever, are uh, have had some autonomy around uh, deciding how to spend their money. So it'll be a little bit of a shift for us to come back and say, Oh, there was no conferences going on, so we'll just take all that money back or you need to give it back or whatever. 
Um, uh, also knowing that there are lots of other expenses that are happening uh, as people are being paid um, off contract to do additional work to uh, plan for this uh, all stuff. So um, uh, we're we're definitely going to be recouping some of those dollars that just aren't being spent uh, because of what's what's going on. Uh, and some of those like extra duty contracts for the chess club and the you know whatever's happening at schools that uh, isn't happening uh, with the virtual learning. Um, from the CARES Act, uh, I'm sure just about everybody in a in the finance office, budget office, whatever is uh, getting all kinds of requests. Hey, I heard the district has a, a big pot of money to spend, and so here's my great idea uh, of what to do with that. Um, and uh, basically I've said, you know, at this point, everything that is being spent is a general fund expense, because if we can uh, shift costs onto CARES, uh, that's gonna add to fund balance um, and uh, those dollars are more flexible and we can use them uh, however we like, which would include keeping people employed into the second half of this year or into next year, uh, as we would need to carry forward the, those fund balances. So um, a lot of mis misunderstanding and misinterpretation uh, of what it means to have um, these federal dollars available uh, and folks not understanding that um, uh, we don't have all the money on the regular side of the, the budget uh, to spend. And this isn't just all extra money to, to move forward with. Sure. sure. To uh, cut anyone off in the line, I'm, I'm going to move over to the next poll here since we're getting close to the top of the hour. But if somebody had uh, one of the panelists had uh, some more thoughts to share on on this question, please please go ahead. But uh, the, if not, we have the the, the final poll here, um, and it regards who or where are you going for information regarding COVID nineteen and related impacts? Is it your county health department? Is it the state? Um, are you looking at more federal guidance? Are there other associations that you're looking at, whether it's your kind of local, um, uh, maybe maybe state ASBO, state GFOAs, or, or the like? Um, you know, just kind of curious and see if there's um, some areas that, that maybe folks on the line hadn't looked towards in terms of information and, um, you know, just kind of getting a sense from others as to what some of their go-tos are. And I so, have so the, some of your go-tos, so sorry, Judy. So, yeah, um, thank you, Matt. I actually go to all of the above. I, I I don't know if I have more time than other people do or I'm willing to work till midnight to do my other work more often, but um, I participate with GFOA anytime they have an offering. I work with all the other large districts, some of who are on this panel with me through the Council of Great City Schools, which has been a big resource. The best resource for me has been my own um, uh, division of ASBO, which has been uh, FASBO in Florida, where we're working together. And, and what we have found is if we're all doing the same thing, it kind of gives us cover. So all of us did a complete hiring freeze uh, a few months back in South Florida, because then people don't have another district to go apply for a job in because they're frozen too. That's been a great help where we're kind of looking to our neighbors to see what they're doing to see if that helps with the messaging for our boards. Um, somewhat with federal agencies, mostly through Emily and her weekly webinars. Uh, Emily's with GFOA. Um, but I think the more inputs we get, the better decisions we make. Great. Maybe just if any of the other panels have one other comment to make, just want to be respectful of time here. And sorry, we can press a little bit on the back end here. So, Matt, the, the other piece that I just want to put out there is that, you know, we talk about communication. The one other piece, in addition to utilizing information from associations and local uh, representation, uh, we've also been utilizing information that our labor unions have put out. Um, and we've been using that, um, you know, as a resource to tie back to you know employees when we get any pushback uh to you know to reference and say you know well the same thing we're telling you about what pay status you go into if you're under a quarantine order 
it, it, you know, it ties here and that's helped to build consistency and credibility and avoid kind of people running off in different directions. Great. No, and, and for folks, once we flip out of this poll, if you haven't responded or are still in the process of responding, uh, don't worry, the poll will remain open and you'll be uh, re recorded and it won't be any effect on your CPU with related to that. So don't worry about that. So. Um, just wanted to take this the next minute or two. I know we're at time here, but just to kind of share some some additional resources. The one thing that we have here is a, a survey in terms of how uh, COVID and the related impacts have affected your district. Uh, and what we hope to to use some of that information for is to better uh, inform legislators legislators in uh, DC in terms of what's impacting you. Um, as I'm sure you know from the CARES Act money, the amount that went. To and, and directly for schools was was minuscule in terms of, of the overall needs and and, rep, and not representative of of how big of a portion of, of local government expenditures that school districts account for, um, and just want to make them know. And even with the proposals that are out there from the House and Senate side, um, you know, wanting to better inform them in terms of of the the, the pressing needs of school districts and and also uh, the essential services, as all of us know, in terms of the pressures to reopen in terms of related to childcare and the economy and the alike. So uh, we'd appreciate the responses there and the URL is there. Um, we have uh, other uh, or fiscal first aid related documents there that are all hyperlinked up on this screen, uh, whether it's uh, the, the main pieces on balancing the budget and bad times part one or two, or more specific guidance on uh, cash flow, uh, procurement office, and then also looking at paper-based processes as well. Uh, we have a, a webinar on the 18th. Uh, I think this one uh, will be really good as well. Uh, talking more about communications, which, as you can hear from our panelists today, is really important. Um, Education Resource Strategies, uh, a nonprofit out of Boston, is going to be leading that with the CFOs from Tulsa Public Schools and Denver Public Schools, talking more about their um, strategic communications and, and how that's benefited them. And then also, uh, we have a, a virtual training on our school budgeting best practices on September 29th through October 1st, if you're wanting to hear more about that. Uh, and then also, we have the Alliance for Excellence in School Budgeting, which has been scheduled for uh, early November in a virtual setting as well. It'll be our sixth iteration. Um, again, uh, all the panelists have been a part of this at, in one form or another at some point. Um, and uh, it's it's a really great opportunity to bring your leadership team together to talk more about strategic planning and budgeting. Uh, and finally, we have URLs up towards a number of resources that we have from our fiscal first aid, more general guidance for all types of governments, including school districts, smarter school spending, our best practices, our COVID-19 response center. And of course, if there's any kind of questions that you have, uh, whether it's related to this or other things that you think GFOA uh, can help you with, uh, please reach out to me. I'm uh, the lead contact for our school districts and um, more than uh, happy to help you and point you in the right direction for, for anything that you might be looking for. So uh, so with that, I wanna thank you so much to our panelists for taking time out of your, your busy day uh, and your busy schedule really as we have planned this over the last couple of days. Um, and thanks to all of you for taking time out of your busy schedule as well to sit in and listen. And I hope you were able to, to tap a, a few uh, useful takeaways. Um, and uh, again, just wanna wish you good luck and. Uh, um, uh, and, and the like in terms of, of uh, relation to school opening. Uh, stay safe, stay well, and um, let us know if you need anything. So take care.